these are amazing poets, Adam and I. Yes. And they are here today to give us workshops. Yes. So <laughs> I <laughs> go ahead and <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so hello again. Uh, my name is Autumn White Eyes. I am from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Um, I have spent about the last 10 years on the East Coast um, for college and grad school. So I went to Dartmouth and for undergrad and I went to Harvard Graduate School of Education for graduate school. And um, I've had a lot of different experiences working with young people in the Bronx and in the Boston area and with families and with youth um, in the classroom. Um, but mostly in alternative spaces, so not necessarily always, you know, 7 a.m. to plus hours in the classroom, as I'm sure many of you have um, experienced. So I also want to say, you know, excuse me if I don't, you know, know a lot of the other educational aspects of what young people are going through. But a lot of my focus in education has been about creating safe spaces for young people and a space where they can um, really fully express themselves and um, in a trauma-informed way because our native young people um, are experiencing a lot of different external factors from home life and community life that affect their lives. And so that work has kind of led me also to how we use um, spoken word and storytelling for youth to self-express. Um, I'm also a spoken word artist. I actually started writing when I was very young um, and through an opportunity with First Peoples Fund, I was able to travel to Los Angeles for Brave New Voices, which James Cass over here is a founder of. <laughs> and, um, and through that experience, just saw young people really expressing themselves fully, um, uninhibited, on the stage, just going for it. And it really inspired me to continue to work on my own spoken word poetry and now doing that work with young people on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Um, so, Dayaya Hippie, welcome. Um, we'll just do a quick round of introductions, and maybe we'll do it again when Patay Sangwi comes back <laughs> as well. So um, just your names, whatever gender pronouns you're using today, and if you feel comfortable to share where you're from and what is your favorite board game or video game. So I'm Autumn. I use they, she from Pine Ridge. I already said all that. Um, my favorite video game right now is Apex Legends, which is a fun Xbox, and actually it's on all the systems. And also Phase 10 is a card game I really love to play. Are you? Oh, no, no, OK. <laughs> um, and I will go this way. <laughs> Aloha, you can call me Ulu, do uh, my she, her pronouns. I am from Oahu, uh, Hawaii. And my favorite board game is Catan. Mm, Catan. I love I yeah. love Catan too. <laughs> Hi, my name is Allison, and I use the pronoun she, her. I'm from San Diego, California, but I live in DC now. And my favorite board game is Bananagrams. Oh, oh nice! Oh, I like Bananagrams too. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Sarah. I use uh, she, her. And um, we moved to D.C. when I was two from uh, what, Lancaster County um, in Pennsylvania. And um, my favorite board, I forget the name of it, but it's one where you have to um, you pick a card and it's like you get these two weird words that are disconnected and then you have to sell it to the, the person who's the, like in the main chair and you have to like <laughs> invent like I don't know. It's like you get a word like purple shirt, and then you have to sell this purple shirt. Some of the reason is, and then everyone goes around to sell. Interesting. Like some kind of reason why, and then they pick one, and then you get a point. It's it's a lot of it's hilarious. It's really hilarious. You know. Okay, Aloha. I'm Iomai Lani. Kukeni Ko. She her. I'm from um, Oahu, Hawaii, and. 
video games. I don't know, it would be like Ms. Pac-Man. I <laughs> <laughs> um, Love it. Me. Um, and I, I guess, or now would be like Wordle, and I'm obsessed with video mm-hmm. games. Um, favorite board game, how do you scrabble? This is different to Wordle. Yeah. <laughs> I'm James. Oh, so many great. I'm James. I'm Tejas. I have called the San Francisco Bay Area home for about 35 years. I think my favorite board game, well, I like Scrabble too. I just like chess, but mm-hmm. I actually like Scrabble too. Mm-hmm. So we we just I just introduced myself in a little bit about how I got started with Dances of Words, and we're doing the intros, name, pronouns, where you're from, and favorite board game. And I don't know if you, if you want to introduce more about yourself and like how you got involved with dances with words and stuff, too. I, I could. Okay. I could. <laughs> oh, can you hold this mic? Yeah. Hello. Is it on? It, they, they can hear it in the recording. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> um, so my name is Ptasami, little white man. My pronouns are they, them. I'm from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. I reside in the Medicine Root District. Um, my favorite board game is Mancala. <laughs> but um, I've been in the Dances with Words program since I was like 13, 14 years old. Um, I started writing poetry when I was about 12. And I participated in it because it was like a poetry program, like a little workshop to do after school and stuff. So it's kind of how it started for me. And I just was hooked to it after like getting so much like encouragement from the mentor and being told like, you know, you can go places with your poetry, like just keep at it, it heals you. And it really does, it really heals you. Um, so I've been with the program for a very long time. And then I recently started to be, um, the youth development co-coordinator for the program. So dancers with words, I became a mentor for it now. So I help teach youth, um, poetry and show them different forms and expose them to, um, fellow indigenous poets and their writing and, um, helping them encourage them to hopefully be able to continue writing because it really impacts our community. Come on in, we're just uh, introducing ourselves. Um, I'm wondering if we could do another quick round, could you, if you could just say your name and pronouns this time, so uh, Patay Sami could get caught up. Yeah. And a lot of folks in here like Scrabble and Bananagrams and oh. Another cool card game I learned about. Alohang Ulu and Agaba Shihai. Andrea Seeger, she, her. I, Allison, uh, she, her. And Sarah, and she, her. Ew, she, her. You know, you know James. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I don't know if you wanted to share your favorite board game or video game? That was our check-in question. Oh, I love Pounce with like eight people and eight decks of cards. Oh, <laughs> wow, cool. Did you want to share yours too? Um, Mancala. Oh, I like oh, the Mancala. little one with the pebbles. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. I love it. Alrighty, so we're going to go through what we're going to do today, which is we already did our icebreaker. And then I'm going to go through an overview of kind of what our pedagogy and methodology is with Dances with Words. And then we're going to go into an identity workshop that Pate Sangwi is going to model for you all on like how we do the work that we do. So um, can I have one of those handouts? (laughs) Thank you. Um, So a little bit about our program. It's called Dances with Words. That name was chosen by one of the young people in the program, and it's kind of a play on dances with wolves, but um, dances with words, as in we're using our words, we're speaking and using spoken word poetry. Our program, the structure of our program is that we hire teaching artists from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, and they hold local workshops for young people, either in the classroom classroom through teaching residencies or um, at our new Oglala Lakota art space, which is like the first of its kind art studio space on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Um, 
so it's been really exciting to do this sort of work and for us being from Pine Ridge, being able to pass on the art that we do to um, the next generation has been really impactful for me personally. And I don't know how you feel, but, <laughs> but um, you know, part of the work that we do is working from a curriculum so that we have structure and, and we're um, teaching in a way that's building and scaffolding off of each other and um, knowing our history and ourselves um, honoring our ancestors and relations and sharing our knowledge and stories. So we kind of saw those three main topics as an as a avenue to build upon our work. And I'll get more into that in a second. Um, so we work from a youth-centered pedagogy. And so if you have your handout, we have like our formal definitions here. Um, but basically, we, in our program, are focusing on um, young people being the leaders in the classroom. Um, seeing them as whole and full people who have their own um, opinions and really valuing um, where they're coming from, not just like essentializing them or making them feel like, oh, because you're a young person, you know what the future is going to hold and we hold you up on this. But like really being a supportive ally and accomplice to them, guiding them and giving them the space to share their own their own opinions and voice and a lot of the time the young people come to the space and they're not as confident or they're a little bit more reserved um, and but as time goes on we see them getting more comfortable to really like make um, space for themselves and we just are providing that space and acting as guides but not necessarily teachers or um, I don't know like authority figures but we kind of see ourselves more as like aunties and uncles and yeah i was gonna say that yeah <laughs> um since i'm like the youngest i'm yeah i'm like the youngest worker yeah <laughs> i i'm like really awkward whenever i like do the things but i noticed that i think because i'm vocally telling people like yeah i did not mean to say that or like you know just being awkward i think it makes the youth notice like okay so like I can be comfortable because you're comfortable. I mean, you're awkward, but you're comfortable. And over time, they do start to become more like comfortable being vulnerable around us, telling us their personal, um, their personal views, their personal opinions on like a poem we read, or if um, something stood out to them and reminded them of something, they'll like talk about that. And sometimes we even go over time um, like whenever virtually we were on virtual because of COVID, um, there was a time where we went over like a whole hour because like the youth just wanted to talk about what we were discussing. Mm -hmm. And there was no problem with that. We did not mind it at all because we were just more focused on like. It was like a talking circle almost of like just airing out the things that were frustrating for them mm -hmm. during that time. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, we got really good feedback from them about how we're just able to give them that space mm -hmm. to be themselves and um, openly express themselves with not, without fear of judgment. Um, and so some of the ways we do this is through Tioshbae building. So in Lakota language, Tioshbae is our, extend, our word for extended family. Um, it's kind of hard to explain everything, <laughs> but basically, um, in our culture, we have an extended tioshbae or extended family. It would be the family you would camp with uh, historically, um, the people who would be in your um, home, like in your teepee um, camping circle. Um, and basically with our young people, we're trying to instill or further that um, idea of Lakota kinship of being with family and treating one another as you should like a good relative and being accountable to one another and um, holding one another accountable and being able to speak to one another if an issue arises but also encourage one another and be supportive to one another and really treat one another as good family members. Um, we also have a safer space um, policy um, which is that you know, we want to make sure everyone feels safe to be them full selves, their full selves in the space, regardless of race, sex, gender, um, religious status, sexuality, skin color, identity, expression, cultural background. 
and like really recognizing that there's power and privileges attached to all of those identities and um, being cognizant of what that power and privilege is. And part of our workshops are to help young people understand that power and privilege and how it plays out in spaces. Um, we make sure to um, encourage young people to be able to be their full selves in, in terms of like their gender, especially because a lot of our young people are gender queer, gender non-conforming or trans youth. Um, so for them to be able to feel like they have a safe space to go to, that they're not gonna be judged, whereas they might feel that judgment in the community or among family members, they're able to be their full selves with us in the space and we respect who they are and respect how they wanna be treated among their family members as well. So asking them, you know, what are your pronouns with us that you're comfortable using? What are the pronouns you want us to use with your parents? Um, so just being very cognizant of their own coming out journey and where they are in their own journey. Um, and so now I'll get more into like this honoring. This is our community agreements. They're really great. I don't think we're gonna go into them. What do you think, Fatesh Sami? We could go through the, like the the next one. You know, the ones the ones with like our word is our weapon, our bodies are ours. Cause um that ties into like what Autumn said about how um we make sure to make them be accountable for the things that they write and the things that they say. Um, we always remind them that our word is our weapon. We use them to uplift others, we don't bring others down. So we don't write about like, oh, I hate this person or I hate how they do this and that. We do not, we don't really want them to write those types of things. Like it's good to write, to journal that, but whereas our poetry and where we're going with our program, we want them to uplift our communities. We want them to uplift their communities, their families, their relations that they have elsewhere, whether it be with their friends, their pets, or even with themselves, because, um, Poetry is all about talking about the things that you see and wanting to make a change, but also wanting to be sure to find that change within yourself to adapt to those things, to be able to not let those things control you and make you um, self-destruct, so to say. Um, and um, yeah, word is our bond, word is our weapon, our bodies are ours, our space is trusted. So. Where does our bond is kind of like, um, you know, speaking openly and honestly with one another, like, hey, I didn't like how you said this about um, this certain thing because it made me feel this way. Maybe you could keep that in mind for the next time. It could even be with the poets themselves or it can be with what we might have said. So we always make sure to let them know to be vocal with us because we will respect that. We won't ever judge them. And we are learning as well. We, we learn as we go with all of the poets that we've been with. Um, our bodies are ours. So we never just, you know, ah, and like touch them or whatever, like just hold their hands or like put their, our hands on their shoulder or anything. We don't go for a hug without asking. We make sure and ask them ahead of time, like, can I hug you? Do you need space? Do you, what, what do you need that I can give you? because we always want to make sure to make our youth feel comfortable with us and our space. And our space is trusted is like, um, what's said here stays here. So don't take what you say in this space to other places. What this poet has said, do not talk about it to other people. What um, a mentor has said openly about you or about themselves, don't take it elsewhere. Um, don't tell your friends and family about that person and their story and their life, because that's not yours to say. Um, but that's what um, some of our community agreements are. We always make sure to let our youth know ahead of time before we get into the program and before we get into the lesson to make sure that they know and they are aware of these. Um, sometimes we go over it a couple times with them, even if they've been in the program for quite some time, just to remind them. Mm -hmm. um, and they add their own as well, like what they don't see listed here, or what stuff they want specifically about this space. Like sometimes it's also funny stuff, like always have um, pineapples or something. Wasn't that on the list yeah. recently? Yeah, that was one of the things. <laughs> pineapple. 
she's like, we need pineapple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so really just like respecting what they want in this space and, um, and um, really trying to practice a culture of consent as well and like not pushing them too much, um, but like also allowing there to be like, like we don't, we don't push them to be uncomfortable, but like we don't see a problem with discomfort either. Like if there's a poem, like we lean into it, we talk about trigger warnings, we, um, we give them the space to talk about issues that are hard, um, but we also give them the space to decompress and be away from it if it's too much. So we have a decompression station in the room with us when we're working with them. That includes cultural things like sage and water, um, tea and a diffuser, as well as fidget toys. We just got a beanbag chair. We did? <laughs> yeah, I just bought it. Oh my God. <laughs> and there's like a space for them to decompress if stuff does get too difficult because, you know, that's a part of our way of um, being trauma informed in this space, as well as like providing agendas, going through community agreements, making sure that they know when they step into this space, it's gonna be a routine every single time um, and they know what to expect. So being cognizant of those PTSD complex trauma triggers that could happen for a young person. So when you guys are sharing, you know, some of the stuff that you've written, do you like scaffold the way you introduce it to them? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna get into it now. Sorry, <laughs> kind I, of. I, I'm sorry, I had it more about the um, triggering. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think in terms of the poetry that we do, do you feel like it's scaffolded from like, from like the first unit, second unit? No, I don't think so. I think it's all like. You just answered your own question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty deep stuff every time. But it's just like, and sometimes it's not that deep, but it's like we have to provide those trigger warnings and tell them what the topics are going to be today um, so they know what we're going to be getting into. Do you feel though that sharing your own work helps to create that sense of comfort amongst the young people? Yeah, so what we do, we normally, um, well, if Autumn is um, having meetings and I'm running the lesson and the workshops, um, when we have the creating portions, I always make sure that I'm creating as well with them. So that way, um, or like, um, we'll get into it a little bit more, but we do annotating. And I always make sure to let them know, like, I'll share what I wrote if that makes you comfortable. I will share what I wrote and I will share what I annotated. And usually, um, in the first couple days of like the workshops they they don't really share they don't really annotate sometimes they do sometimes they do share um, but I always let them know you can share the whole thing you can share a line or you can share a word or you can share a feeling that you had with this poem um, it doesn't have to be exactly word for word it can just be happy that's it you can just tell me one word that's it that's all that matters to me um, but yeah, I make sure to let the youth know that I also am a poet. I'm one of you. We're in the same generation. Um, so you're not alone. I'm not going to judge you for your poetry. Um, and most of the time, they always end up writing a lot. They write a lot, and then they share. They're slowly getting used to sharing everything they wrote. Sometimes, Most of the time, they just share like a line they wrote, a word. But now I notice that they're getting so comfortable with us that they're sharing almost everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Patisali. So I'm gonna, where's my mouse? Oh, there it is. Okay, so I'm gonna go into a little bit about what our learning trajectory is. So we do stuff in three different units. Um, 101, knowing our history and ourselves, 201, honoring our ancestors and relations, and 301, sharing our stories and knowledge. And that same structure is also built into our actual workshop structure and the time that we meet with young people. 
So 101, it's really about young people are writing about themselves, knowing our history and ourself, really knowing, you know, um, we, we do a close reading of a treaty. We do a, a close reading of the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, which is probably one of the most important, is the most important treaty for Lakota people and the Great Plains area. It was the last treaty that took the unceded land of Lakota people. And so we do a close reading of that treaty. And so it's, a, it's, his, it's using historical language. And then we look, at, um, we look at poetry that was made in response to that treaty as examples from um, poets in our communities. And then they're prompted to also write their own response poem to the treaty as well. We also do in that um, section, uh, we create our own winter count, which was our traditional um, way of keeping history. Um, so it's a huge buffalo robe with um, our history recorded in circular uh, motions, but we do that through like creating our own writing about what was important to us this year and what do we want to pass down to the, the next generation. Um, we talk about oral history and also oral history, like using our ears, so critical listening and how that's been, that's an important cultural aspect uh, to who we are is being able to be good listeners, um, active listeners, critical listening, and how that's also a part of poetry. Next, we go into, thank you, <laughs> is it, um, honoring our ancestors and relations. So that unit is more about um, reading, um, artists who are also from our communities and native artists or um, non-native artists, non-native poets, reading their work as well, and then prompted to more learning about form. What are the different poetry styles that there are? Um, lyrical, odes, group poems. We're very focused on spoken words, so that's like a huge chunk of what that is. Um, and then sharing our stories and knowledge. This is where we get more into youth being a lot more comfortable to share out loud, to share their work, um, to create with one another, to practice their performance and revision. Um, so that's what that unit looks like. And so, um, uh, I have this uh, workshop template here um, on your handout. And so basically, um, the way we start our workshops is through cultural settings. So we'll start with a prayer, a spirit plate, a circle, our kinship agreements, our safer space policies. We have our check-in questions and intros, and we share a meal with one another. Um, then when we get into the actual meat of the workshop, um, we'll do a free write or a warm-up activity where youth are prompted to write about themselves or respond to some sort of question that's related to um, the topic of the workshop. And then with analysis, we'll take a look, that's where we take a look at the different types of poem, the different forms that we're reading about, um, have di having discussions, doing the annotation, um, and then, uh, we start creating. And so then there's this writing activity that's gonna teach us about form or about some sort of aspect of the main topic that we're talking about. Lastly, we share and affirm. So this is where sharing our stories and knowledge comes in. Um, so we're um, sitting in a circle and we each are trying to share a little bit of our poetry and getting comfortable to actually speak our poetry out loud. So yes, that's kind of the Thing. Yes. How often do you meet? It's, it's, it's not on site at the school. Yeah. We're on site at, um, we're tr well, we're trying to build more partnerships with schools, but we were in a school once a week. And then um, we meet at the Oglala Art Space once a week. And then in the summertime, we're meeting three times a week. That's for our Emerging Poets Fellowship. That's more of an advanced curriculum. So when, um, this is the introductory cur curriculum, so mm -hmm. this will be for more of like writing about like poetry and Like yourself. first time writers. Yeah, and then the advanced curriculum will be more on like um, 
building yourself up as a professional poet, as an artist. So they'll be going through like budgeting your artworks, whether it be because we don't um, we don't strictly make the youth become poets. We we advise them like if you have other art forms, feel free to tell us about that. This curriculum, this advanced curriculum circulates all of that. So we have some poets that are beaters, some of them that are um, quilt, 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 what's that word? And graffiti artists. Yeah, too. graffiti artists. So we always let them like know that they can, they can still be a poet and or artist at the same time. I always tell my and, family. Oh, I was gonna say, and we're both like multidisciplinary yeah. artists too. So like finding ways you could also bring poetry into your visual arts or your multimedia arts, film, what we try to bridge those gaps too. Yeah. Um, so the advanced curriculum would be like talking about their budgeting f and making an artist statement, making a poet bio, uh, making a portfolio, an artist portfolio, and um, just talking to them more about the logistics of being an artist and be making it your profession. Is there any other questions? If not, I'm going to hand it back to Patesawi to do a modeling. Um, we have about 25 minutes left. So um, this is a picture of our young poets meeting. Um, we hold a big poetry slam competition at um, the Civic Center in Rapid City, um, South Dakota. and. Um, this is a workshop time that we had with them. I'm in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so um, normally I'm always standing because it just feels, I don't know, it feels better to stand for me. Um, but whenever we go into the uh, lesson, I, we always do the agenda for the day, let the youth know what to expect so they're not just blindsided. We do the intros, do a short little check-in, kind of like what we did today. Um, and then we go into the, um, the lesson. So identity, what is an identity that is important to you or that you have? So I would ask the youth um, this question, let them think about it, let them marinate in it, um, and ask them to just keep that in mind or if they want to share now, they can share. And um, that one is bolded because that's the first question we wanna focus on and then um, Throughout the lesson, we'll ask the other questions. Yes. So this is the this is what we would normally use if we were on virtual. The Nearpod was really helpful to be able to let the youth have a place to express themselves and tell us like their thoughts in the. So we might that. put here like. If they would be like popcorning what their answers are. Yeah, like so this like would be a time women. for them to just put whatever down. And okay. there's GIFs, so GIFs, whatever, <laughs> moving image. Um, <laughs> they could use that to, like, if they don't want to say a word, they can use a picture to kind of like express that. Um, so, they, yeah, they like, so like if they wanted to do like two spirit or something. They might choose this and put it in there. Yeah. And then once that's done, we'll um, go through all of the answers they gave us and, you know, thank them for being able to share that. And um, yeah, I'll even put stuff down too to kind of like add more so that way if they need help, because sometimes there are questions that um, are hard to answer, like, um, What's a way to decolonize? Sometimes they might not know what the answer might be. And if you put down like um, having a, a smudging circle in a non-native environment or allowing your nephews to have braids in school and letting them braid their hair, like teaching them how to braid their hair, speaking your native tongue in non-native settings. Those are ways of decolonizing. Um, like we will put those down and sometimes the youth will even like know more than what we might even know. The same thing. Other, yeah. uh, then we, we'll we, go through each of the questions. Yeah. 
you know, this one, how does power and privilege relate to your identity? So this is where, you know, we'll talk, well, first we establish, you know, what is a stereotype with them? And most of the time they know already. Mm. Um, and then have you ever thought about power or privilege being attached to one of your identities? And this is where they might say, yeah, I think I have more power as a, as a cis man because um, I don't understand what my sisters go through out in the world, or um, I think I have power as a light-skinned native person because um, I don't know what it's like for my relatives who are have brown skin and how they're treated out in the world. And so this is where we get into, like, how is power and privilege attached to your different identities? Can I, can I comment on that? Yeah. I really love that. Because I love it that you're asking everybody to also name the power. Mm-hmm. Not just name the marginalization. Mm-hmm. Name the yeah. That's really nice. Yeah. Yeah, and the same thing. Um, and then we have, like, a, another workshop similar to this where it's all focused on your power in your identity, how you feel affirmed in your identity, what are the things you need to feel better in your identity, or what are the things you need to feel better in who you are as well. Do you find that sometimes, you might have another question? Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Do you, do you find that sometimes that maybe the first time that somebody finds power in their identity? I'm just gonna ask one more question. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Uh, that, I feel like that question would be more answered for when I was a youth. Uh-huh. So um, probably my personal experience. I did not know my own power mm-hmm. as a youth, um, like a gender fluid youth who is still finding their identity, still trying to figure everything out, um, going through imposter syndrome as a light skinned indigenous person. Um, it was, it's interesting, it's empowering as well, but it's also kind of um, makes you feel more aware of your own capabilities and being able to uplift your other relatives that might not have those capabilities that you do. So being able to say, hey, I notice you're, you're kind of excluded. Um, I could bring you in to this if you want. Um, and also noticing like people in your life that are not in the program, but you know that they have those capabilities to be in the program. And do you just kind of like ask them like, hey, I, I, I know this program, you could really um, gain things from this. You could really take things away from this as well. Um, I also noticed that some of my um, fellow poets that were in the program before we all graduated, also have been able to notice their own identities and their own power within their own identities through this program. And it's like a whole process, our own internal processes. We all have gone through our own internal um, perspectives of it, but I noticed that we all came out completely more empowered, more knowledgeable on who we are and who we can be, because we're not just who we are right now. We are still learning and growing and um, especially as a poet. Mm-hmm. That makes me think that it probably also engenders pride, but I mean pride in a good way, that this is who I am, this is my culture, this is my history. And I'm guessing that it might also encourage people in general to learn more about who they are and where they come from. Mm-hmm. Does, that, does that reflect in their work? Yeah, usually most most of the time, mm-hmm. especially when it's around um, Pride Month, the Pride Month. So, um, or when we talk about our identities and stuff, some of them will be like, "I am a lesbian. I am gender queer. Mm-hmm. I am gender fluid. I am non-binary." Um, and using those things, they're able in their poetry. They talk about themselves, um, referring to themselves as their own pronouns or you know, referring to their relatives on how they refer to them or how their relatives view them and being able to say, no, I'm this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also noticed over time, they, they still go through processes of discovering who they are. Yeah. And they say, okay, I thought I was a they, them. I feel more he, him. And that's when they start telling us as well as mentors I feel like I'm more he, him, those are my pronouns. And we're like, okay, yeah. he, him, those are your pronouns. 
Yeah, I've definitely noticed that like as they come in, even had like a young person who came in who was really proud of being Lakota, really proud of being native, all like learning her language and everything. And then as time went on, she was, she's having this becoming of like questioning of like the different aspects of her identity and questioning her gender because of being around us and having these conversations right we're talking about heteronormativity patriarchy privilege all these different things and so i think it it does make you question your own identity and where you're at and being able to be in a safe space where you feel comfortable then you feel that comfort to be more into that becoming and prideful of of who you are yeah and when the youth do become like more open with who they are discovering being more open with discovering who they are it's like you can see their glow in them. Mm -hmm. Like in the beginning, they're just kind of like closed off. They're just, they don't really feel comfortable. But once they start to get more comfortable discovering their identity, it's like they're so excited to be able to be around people that make them feel safe enough to be like, okay, yeah, this is how I feel. Um, this is who I wanna, this is how I wanna be referred to now. And we, when we affirm that, they immediately just you can see it in their eyes and in their writing that they are very comfortable and happy um but yeah that's yeah <laughs> all righty so john um, trudell homies <laughs> <laughs> um so this is when we would get into like the portion of like analyzing so I'll ask the youth to, um, this is John Trudeau, talk about the bio, um, and then we'll ask the youth to like read. It could be like a line or it can be the whole, the stanza, but we always ask the youth to just read um, some portion of it. Um, we popcorn read or we let them like just choose. We usually like popcorn, um, but yeah, we, we always, show the bio of who we are reading first before we get into the actual Do you poem. all, should we listen to this? Yeah, we could, I think it's best to listen. We usually also, if there's a video for them to listen to, we'll listen to it and then we'll read it with them. So that way they could have a better um, perspective with their, coming from their own voices. It might take me a second to find it. Isolated and a dimension called loneliness. There are some things I maximize profit, sterilization, raping the earth, lying. Would you send him back to them to take all we had? Did our anchor look at us? We are struggling. Okay, it's like towards the end of this other song. <laughs> For you to decide what life is worth, we already remember, but maybe you forgot. Look at us, look at us, we are of earth and water. Look at them, it is the same. Look at us, we are suffering all these years. Look at them, they are connected. Look at us, we are in pain. Look at them, surprised at our anchor. Look at us, we are struggling to survive. Look at them, expecting sorrow be benign. Look at us, we are the ones called pagan. Look at them on their arrival. Look at us, we are called subversive. Look at them, descending from name callers. Look at us, we wept sadly in the long dark. Look at them, hiding in technologic light. Look at us, we buried the generations. Look at them, inventing the body count. Look at us, we are older than America. Look at them, chasing a fountain of youth. Look at us, we are embracing Earth. Look at them, clutching today. Look at us, we are living in the generations. Look at them, existing in jobs and debt. Look at us, we have escaped many times. Look at them, they cannot remember. Look at us, we are healing. Look at them, their medicine is patented. Look at us, we are trying. Look at them, what are they doing? Look at us, we are children of Earth. Look at them, who are they? So after we usually show the video and we read it through, we ask them to annotate anything that stood out to them, anything that reminded them of whatever it is. We ask them to annotate or even doodle on the page that 
that whatever it is that they reminded them of or a shape that may have like came up to them. Um, and all the, most of the time they always share what they annotated. They always share like, I really liked what they said about um, like his, what was it again? We are the ones called pagan, look at them on their arrival. I remember one of the youth mentioned that one and they said, they talked about how when they came here, they were flaunting their religion to us and murdering us and committing genocide amongst our people when they called us pagan as if like they weren't the ones forcing their religion onto us, committing genocide. Um, and a couple of them even shared about how the last part with like, look at them, what are they doing? Look at us, we are children of earth. Look at them, who are they? Kind of like they explained how for their perspective, it's like we are the children of earth because we were so connected with it, but who are they? Because they are murdering her, they are hurting her, they are committing climate, they are like causing so much climate change issues. They are causing fossil fuels, coal mining, they are doing littering, and they were able to find connections to what is happening right now and what happened then to this poem. And it's not just this poem, it can be multiple different poems that we've read with them. And also like questions too that they have. Like I remember, I think it's the, I remember in a workshop, they were like, I saw like the line that says, look at them hiding in te technological light. Look at us, we, are bur we buried the generations. Like this feeling, I remember coming up about like, because the young people are from a generation where they're using technology a lot, they were like, well, that made me think a lot because I use my phone so much. And it's like, but it's like, um, it makes me think about that and like how that culture of being like always on the phones and the computers makes me think about like, and like how we're, in this virtual world now. And I think it was during COVID too. So like that feeling was coming up <laughs> because of that, um, that line. And then, um, and then it, the, we are older than America. Like that's a line that we talk about a lot too. So um, after we annotate, we usually take a break and uh, after we annotate and discuss the poem, we talk about where we see identity coming up in the poem. Um, then we take a break usually in the workshop, but then we yeah. go into a writing prompt. Yeah, it's usually between the writing and the discussion where we take a break and let them kind of digest with what they went through, have them go use the restroom, get a snack. If they need to decompress, they can decompress. Um, but yeah, we go into the writing portion and since we're in person now, um, I always like to tell them, you know, you don't need to sit here at this table. You can go elsewhere and write, you can write someplace else, but be sure to come back at this time. Or if you, if it's that time, I'll come look for you. But this is one of the writing identities. Um, it's a list, but we don't, I don't always tell them like, you can only write three things. I always tell them, write how much you feel is necessary, write how much you want. Like it doesn't, don't feel limited. So they would write identities, their gender, who they are, their race, their family role. They'll write places and people who help them feel empowered and feel powerful. And they'll write about like um, people that makes them feel misunderstood, whether it be like sister, brother, mom, dad, friend, relative. Um, politicians, things like that. They'll write those lists down and then um, it'll be kind of like the crutch for the writing prompt. Just to kind of gather all of their ideas first, um, having all their identities and people and different things listed. And then um, we'll go into this kind of prompt, which is um, ghost lines. But I think the other question to this prompt is, um, is there, um, oh shoot, I forgot what it is. <laughs> That's okay. But it's this prompt that 
basically um, is there an identity you feel powerful or affirmed in or is there an identity that you feel misunderstood or misperceived in and to write about that um, and then we use these ghost lines to kind of help them guide their writing so after they take those lists they can actually plug in like I feel affirmed as whatever identity when I'm at or with this person or place and then um, because so some examples is I feel affirmed as a woman when I'm with other women because I feel like they have my back or I feel powerful as Lakota when when I'm at a white dominating area because I still exist after years of assimilation. And so it's just like these lines that kind of help them then go into a longer poem. Yeah, kind of like let, letting them um, elaborate in further detail about what they mean or letting that line be like their first line of the poem and then they just go. And then once that's done, we go into a sharing and we share what we wrote. And most of the times they write like just that as their poem, um, which isn't bad. We, we don't mind it. It doesn't matter to us. We're just happy that they're writing something, that we're happy that they're able to still find a connection with this and what they've wrote in their lists and um, be able to write the because part of it. Yeah. And sometimes they won't use this at all and they'll just write their own poem. And yeah. And that's always like encouraged if they're, it, sometimes they'll even ask like, can I write about this? Can I write about like whenever I went to Anpo Wichakpi, the all girls school, um, one of the girls asked me, can I write about my story isn't over yet? And the writing prompt was, um, What's a story or um, it was talking, we were talking about Emily. Oh, no, wait, I forgot. I think you guys did a radical we, imagination. Yeah, radical imagination and indigenous futures. Um, one of them was talking about write a, write a poem about a story, rewrite the end of the story. So I gave an example of like Pocahontas, write a story about how, what if she didn't go with John, John Smith? What if, um, the genocide didn't happen, rewrite that story. And her response was, can I write about my story? Can I write about the changing of my ending of my story? And I said, yeah, I highly, I highly recommend you do that. And I wrote it on the board as another writing prompt option if they wanted to do that. And they wrote and they wrote until it was time to share. And they shared, it was really beautiful. And it was really empowering to get to be able to meet these youth and hear what they wrote and get to know them on a little bit deeper level than um, what was expected, what was intended, because I wasn't expecting them to ask me about if I could write about my story or can I change the end of my story. And I was just really happy to be able to let them give that space to them. Yes. Yeah, that's that we do the sharing and then after that we do a closing so we do a closing question like how do you openly express yourself share an affirmation with the person next to you so if they're sitting in like a circle or whatever we ask them like you know just say something nice about them like i like your hair or um like kind of like community building tio mm -hmm. building mm -hmm. like getting more relations in your life mm -hmm. feeling more comfortable with the people around you because you are all there to write, you're all poets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so do, um, we only have a couple minutes left, but I was wondering if anybody had any other questions about um, our work and the structure, anything else that's coming up for you all? Mm -hmm. But it was, it seemed like something that she kept very far from us. But mm. then, like, I'll, like, my friends would be like, oh, you don't read your mom's stuff. I was like, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think my mom wants us to read her stuff. You know, it's something that's so personal. And so, when mm -hmm. you talked about, like, just like, processing this trauma and trauma informed stuff, I was just like, it helps me to have a little bit more 
Understanding or empathy. Like mm -hmm. that, you know, yeah. Like, why, why are you not hearing this or that? So why are you not hearing that? Yeah. And, you know, what I do hear at Pomer too is like, oh, don't talk about don't yeah. talk about my grandma like that. Or don't talk about, you know. Yeah. It, it's really hard for us to hear about her experiences yeah. too. Yeah. So I think she's yeah. just trying to keep us yeah. separate from that. So I was wondering, like, the students that you work with, do they... Do they share with their families, or how does how does that process go? Yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah. So um, I think a lot of young people are writing for that cathartic release too, and I've seen it happen a couple of different ways where family have seen writing. Like a young person will write. I actually saw a young person write about coming out and actually use that poem to come out to their parents mm -hmm. at a big event. <laughs> Yeah, which was like kind of scary, but it was really re like received in a really positive way. And they were like really happy and proud of that young person. And it was a really beautiful moment for them to like embrace their child like that way. Um, but we always tell them like, please only write um, or share if you feel safe to do so. Like don't don't you don't have to share if you don't feel safe to do it like feel um you don't have to push yourself or you or we don't want them to traumatize themselves either like don't get on stage and and you know like let all your trauma flow out of you it's not for the audience it's for you there is a relationship between you and the audience when you perform but like the art that you're creating is for you and it's your art. So you should have control over what you want to share and what you don't want to share. And um, so it's uh, reiterating that message of safety yeah. always. Like um, you're sharing, you're performing this poem for you, not for the audience. This poem is for you. It's not for the audience. How the audience takes that information is up to them. It is not your responsibility. If an audience member approaches you and is like, I really didn't like what you said, just take that and be like, okay, thank you. I'm not having that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you didn't like it, that's fine. But yeah. um, we always try to make sure to let them know like, your words are valid. Everything you say is valid. Your feelings, your thoughts, opinions are valid. Um, and what other people have to say about your po poetry does not matter because what matters is how you see your poetry. What matters is how you view it. And if you want to it, make it better, if you want to make it more empowering, we, us mentors are able to be there and give them that space and give them that encouragement. And if they want constructive criticism, we'll give that to them as well. But most of the time it's never constructive criticism. It's more of like, um, for me personally, I use the thesaurus and the dictionary a lot. So I would always tell them, you can use the thesaurus or the dictionary, look up these words, find out what each word means and incorporate it into your poem to see if that fits right, if that feels right, if it feels right in your mouth to say. And if it does, keep that word in there. Or when, we're, when they're writing especially, and they're writing and they write a word that wasn't supposed to be there, I always tell them, keep it keep that word there because it was meant to be there. Mm -hmm. You wrote it for a reason. Mm -hmm. And if you, if it's like you're writing about a simulation and all of a sudden you put down spaghetti, keep it there. <laughs> it just find a way to make it into it. And if it, if you can't just keep it there, it could be just a random like spaghetti to get people's attention and draw them back into the, mm -hmm. to what you were saying. Or like um, when we do revising with them too, it's like, uh, what's that phrase like killing your lovelies killing your, darlings. your darlings yeah <laughs> but like they keep the things like they still keep and then keep the lines and things that maybe they're not going to keep in the poem but they keep it in another document and then they come back to it if they ever need to <laughs> yeah in the context of, of any of your workshops, do you have any culture prompts? 
-hmm. really, like, what are some of the prompts you might give? In my mind, I think, I keep thinking food, art, creativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I keep, I keep having visual images. Yeah, so we do, um, my culture is, we have a, po we have a workshop um, and we read this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful poem by Mark K. Tilson called I Love My People. Um, he's a, he was an activist and organizer for the Standing Rock um, No Daffel camps, and he has a whole book of poetry about it. And we read that poem, and it's a really beautiful poem, very relatable to the young people because um, he's from their community. And um, then the writing prompt is, uh, my culture is, and um, what they do is they, they, we talk about culture using our different senses. So um, what, are, what are the tastes of your culture? So that's where they might write about all the different foods, um, teas, um, that kind of thing, the, the, the different things you might taste from your culture, the smells, um, the sounds, um, the touches, the people, and then the um, ideologies or the values. Um, mm -hmm. And then they take all those lists to help them create a poem about their culture. Yeah, and most of the time we'll also ask them if they want to go outside. Most of the time, if it is involving like needing them to be more grounded with Unchi Macha, Mother Earth, um, we ask them to go outside for this writing prompt. Sit outside, wherever it is. You can sit in the shade, you can sit in the sun, you can sit on a chair outside, um, whatever it may be. And just to have them be able to get more connected with Unchi Macha as indigenous peoples. Yeah. yeah, we have a writing prompt or a workshop where they go outside, take pictures, being like be in nature and like just be outside and experience the outside, then um, take all those pictures and reflections that they had outside to help them guide them in creating a poem or a multidisciplinary art piece with the pictures they take and the poem they create. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> Incredible poems. <laughs> 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 it was live stream. 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 It was live stream.